happen over here. So there we go. It's like that. Right. Okay. So we're just MUD meeting four, uh, bringing together systems thinking and sustainability as sort of a way to create a vision or like a direction for uh, development in our local communities, both at the city level and the provincial level. So um, in our previous class, MUD 201N, I requested our students um, to create like a, a map showing the situation of their local city or municipality. Sorry, I've got some water. So this one was submitted by our student, Faye. Uh, I was currently not here at the moment. Um, on the municipality of Calibo in uh, Aklan. As you can see, it's in the north uh, eastern Visayas, northeastern Visayas. And then, as expected, the municipal population or uh, population count is significantly smaller than the regional population count. Because that's a whole region versus one municipality. It's not even like uh, one third, uh, maybe even less than one fourth, maybe one eighth of the total population of the region. Hmm. Excuse me, my throat's really dry. Uh, so physical factors um, would refer to, as we discussed last, like last last meeting, the uh, the area, the size of the land, the existing uses, basically everything that's tangible can be seen, can be touched in a urban area. Economic factors include population trends, activities, uh, what are people doing in your municipality or province, and the sources of growth. So generally, the activities are very much connected to growth. So if there's more activities, there's more growth. If there are no activities, there's no growth. So it's something, there has to be like something going on in a city or municipality to attract people to come in. And then if the numbers are going up, there's something going on in your municipality or city that needs to be either maintained or improved. You rarely want like to have less activity in your municipality or city. And then social factors include uh, the culture and the behavior and governance of that local area. Specifically for Calibo, um, Faye writes over here, I'll just read it. Uh, main activities that are happening in Calibo are people traveling within the municipality for day-to-day -day activities, such as going to school and work. Some are going to business establishments uh, to shop for their needs and wants, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So uh, again, as we discussed previously, cities are becoming more and more populated, mostly because there's a lot more opportunities compared to the their rural counterparts. This is not to say that the rural areas of the city are less valuable. They are actually very valuable. This is where we grow our food, where um, we maintain the sort of like the natural ecosystem of a city because the paved surface areas are not very good at absorbing rainwater or like waste. And then the unpaved surface areas are good, will be good locations for absorbing rainwater and possible, <clears throat> possible locations for west, waste management sites. Uh, we discussed this earlier, but um, usually you, you wouldn't see waste management facilities in the city center, mostly because of the smell, the hygiene. So these rural areas also need to be maintained, um, not just specifically for waste, but this can be sources of food production, which is mostly uh, the case for Philippine cities, uh, Philippine cities um, in general. And then over here for like uh, social and governance factors, you can see Calibo specifically based on the experience of uh, our student Faye that day-to-day um, -day activities is really the main um, thing that's happening in Calibo. Uh, buying, selling, going to school, going to work. Uh, even though its population is like not the highest in the Philippines, like uh, compared to like Cebu City, which is at 900,000 people, uh, the municipality of Calibo only has like 90,000. So it's like an extra zero less, an extra digit less. But it's still growing. It's still um, important to maintain that growth and make that growth uh, sustainable. So how do you maintain that growth in uh, a, a place like Calibo? So issues identified. The first thing, as we talked about, is identifying the issues, the problems of your site, and then identifying who will be affected by those issues. So um, for Calibo uh, specifically, um, some issues include flooding, narrow sidewalks, road traffic, uh, 
no parking areas or no designated loading and unloading areas, power so shortages, and uh, uh, what do you call it? It's frequent brownouts. So that's a lot of different topics. I'll just write it down here and make a new slide. New slide for, let's put it down here. Let's talk about flooding. Let's talk about uh, side narrow sidewalks. That's a sidewalk. Probably classify that as a poor infrastructure. And then what was the other one? No parking. No parking or lack of parking. Parking and let's see here. I'll just like combine these ones into like power shortages, power shortages. Shortages. So these are uh, issues of um, uh, the municipality. Uh, let's call it, uh, yeah. The moon municipality of Calibo. Okay, so based on our discussion earlier this morning, I'll just give uh, Joseph a recap. Is that Calibo is prone to flooding mainly because of its low elevation and it's also surrounded by mountainous areas, which basically make it a uh, natural catch basin. So we can write that down over here. So flooding caused by physical factors. Uh, let's see, low elevation, low elevation, and uh, high mountain ranges. Rangers, ranges surrounding the urban area. Of course, the solution to that, as stated over here, is a drainage system master plan. So just like identifying where the existing um, drainage systems are, then improving them, uh, highlighting areas that need to be repaired, et cetera, et cetera, drainage system master plan. So I think that's a very good like solution. Narrow sidewalks and poor infrastructure, on the other hand, are it's a bit more tricky. Um, Faye over here, like suggested, uh, road right of way acquisition, basically buying the land off like uh, uh, private owners so they can improve the infrastructure. Uh, let's see. Let me write it down here. R R O W acquisition, acquisition, and then um, involves like uh, involves. Let's put here buying land from. From citizens to improve infrastructure. Okay. Now, this is something that's very interesting to me because um, it's either we use infrastructure for more cars, or public, or versus, or let's say, let's just say, more private transportation or more public transportation. So I'll just highlight this. And that. Now this, that, okay. So what do I mean when I say private or public transportation? Let me just like look up for comparison. Private and public versus public transportation. Transportation. Images. Uh, basically, is that <laughs> is a very good image. Thank you, Google. So I'll just make this a. I can actually make this a separate. Uh, let's just duplicate this slide. Uh, I can erase this. The drainage system master plan is fairly straightforward. Just like we just need like funding to do it. The transfer. And the infrastructure improvement is a bit more complicated for me. Uh, let me refresh. Okay, where did that file go? Save image as. Uh, I saved it to the desktop. Hang on. Okay. Refresh. Okay. Let's full screen this. I think I can. I think I can just do it like this. It's full screen. 
and I'll fix it later. So I'm, I'm sure we all agree that for urban planning, the way to go is really public transportation. Uh, I, I don't think I need to ask like a yes or no for that. And the main reason is because public transportation is just more efficient. So, um, however, if you do disagree, uh, feel free to comment like uh, in the chat or use your microphone. So, mostly, why is public transportation more efficient? You can fit more people into, uh, you can transport the same number of people in the, with a smaller vehicle, and not really a smaller vehicle, but uh, with a vehicle that uses less road space. So you wouldn't need to keep on continuously expanding the road. You can use like your existing road space uh, more efficiently by uh, providing more public transportation. However, in the Philippines, we have the problem that we our road space is probably not uh, ready for buses or large kind of, um, vehicles like these. So where does that leave us? Uh, let me just quickly, um, I wish I could draw this, but where does that leave us? So is our, is bus or in like a public transportation uh, viable for Cebu? I think yes, but we need to sort of uh, break up this uh, problem even further. Maybe I need to do it like that. That looks, does that look too good? Maybe I'll just reduce the font size. Font size 16. Yeah, okay. So let's break this down further. Did you do? Okay. So we all agree it's public transportation is the way to go. Yes. Transportation. And then some factors in this are the uh, actual sizes of the roads. Road widths, widths, and the road widths. What do you call this? Another one. This is a physical factor. Uh, population numbers. Population is an economic factor, and then the behavior of the people this is a social factor and there's a whole document on this like uh, urban mobility and let me just show you quickly for that so there's also a thing called sustainable urban mobility so this i think falls under urban planning more than urban design because the scale is bigger so some factors we'll look at here uh, I didn't have time to put them into the PowerPoint. Uh, let's see. Table of contents, table of contents. Okay, do, do, do. Okay. I can also share this with you if you want. It's a 348 page document. I think this was published middle 2000s, like 2013, 2015, something like that. Oh, excuse me. So, accessibility is a key factor here. Uh, Let's see here, uh, trends and conditions in transport-oriented mobility systems, uh, varying but decli declining dominance of public transport, informality, non-motorized transport, and traffic congestion. So sustainability, sustainability challenges include the integration of land use transport, uh, land use and transportation planning, social dimensions, environmental dimensions, and economic dimensions. We can uh, quickly go through this since um, I think it will be relevant for uh, I think everyone, because it's a very big, uh, urban mobility is a very big uh, urban planning issue. So over here we have, what's this? Uh, average annual population increase in millions. So again, uh, as we discussed earlier in this class that population is increasing throughout the world. What this graph is showing you is the amount of increase in, um, specific countries. Uh, so in light blue, we have China. China like increasing way more in uh, 2010 to 2015 compared to uh, the estimated projections of 2040 to 2045. And then the bigger sort of growth, if you see here in this part, uh, I wonder if I can draw, uh, I think I can draw it here. 
can seem to. Come on. Uh, it's only letting me highlight text. But if you see my mouse, uh, can someone confirm if they can see the mouse? Yes, sir. OK. This dark gray here refers to Latin America and uh, Caribbean countries. So it's increasing more and more as you go to like 2040. And then in the rest of Asia Pacific, this is the gray over here, it's fairly constant. Um, and the Philippines would fit under here, the rest of Asia and the Pacific. Oops, maybe I'll just move this. It's not letting me move it. Uh, maybe, yeah, I'll just leave it down here. Okay, so let's go down to those different uh, topics discussed. So what is, let's see, some forces promoting the transportation bias. What is transportation bias of mobility? Let me zoom in here. In many cities of the world, the equation of mobility with transportation has fostered a tendency towards increasing motorization. Now let me zoom in a bit more, highlighting it. And a propensity propensity to expand the network of urban roads. So this basically refers to like in the 70s and maybe up until today, um, policymakers, people in government still see the problem of traffic congestion as a road with problems. So just increase roads and the problem will solve itself. When in actuality, the real like problem of congestion is that there isn't enough uh, options in transportation. Everyone is forced to use the car. The way we've been developing our cities, we will tackle this in the history lesson uh, probably next week, that the private mode of transportation has dominated um, urban, urban mobility since like um, the 60s, like post-World War II. But globally, the transportation bias of urban mobility is demonstrated by the dominance of motorization and particularly private motor vehicles as pref as the preferred means of mobility so uh, if there's like any question in your mind like why cities are built to like um the benefit of private vehicles now you know it's really because the people who make the decisions uh as to what kinds of uh, improved infrastructure uh, will be happening is really those car owners so luckily uh, today we're focusing more and more on like uh, public transportation, alternative modes of transportation like cycling, and but there's still a long way to go. Uh, in Cebu City particularly, we're still struggling with the sort of unre unre unregulated development of um, CICAD, uh, basically motorcycle, uh, both private and public, and then what they call this the challenges that come with that. Also, our drivers are still not the best. Maybe there's something to be said in the, there could be some research opportunities in the transportation sector regarding the education and training of drivers. How do you get licenses? How does one like maintain their license, et cetera, et cetera. So over here, this is a graph showing the passenger light duty vehicle fleet and ownership rates by region estimates and projections. So in blue, we have ownership rates. In gray, we have uh, uh, OECD. I think this is referring to uh, OECD. That sounds so familiar. Is that something to do with oil? Let me double check. OECD meaning. Organization for Econ Economic Cooperation and Development. So non-OECD, ownership rate, da -da -da. So factors are shrinking city sizes, lifestyle. I think this is for passenger light duty vehicle fleet. Passenger light duty vehicles per thousands of people. And then down here is the year. So basically this is saying there's an increasing number of private vehicles uh, or basically just vehicles in general in cities. So more and more people are basically getting more and more vehicles. So this kind of like indicates that um, if it's a one-to-one -one growth, probably more likely that people are buying vehicles for themselves and not using like a public transportation. So let's just skip to the next option here. That's pretty much it for transportation bias. Uh, trends and conditions in transport-oriented mobility systems. So uh, let's see here, this one is new. 
varying but declining dominance of public transport. In 2005, 16% of all trips in urban areas worldwide were by some form of tra public transport. So only 16%, uh, such as buses and rail-based uh, public transport. The role of public transportation in individual cities varies widely, accounting for 45% of urban trips in some cities in Eastern Europe and Asia. 10 to 20 percent, uh, let me just highlight this, 10 to 20 percent in much of Western Europe and Latin America and less than 5 percent in North America and Sub-Saharan Africa. So at least um, Asia and Eastern Europe have higher sort of use of public transportation. However, I think if we look at Cebu City specifically and specific cities and municipalities in the Philippines, I think that percentage would go down. But the issue here is like we really don't have those numbers or it's not readily available. And then over here is a graph, uh, source 2012 uh, by Pro, ProBikes. Modal splits of urban transport trips, again, highlighting that private motorized transport is a significant number of the uh, mode, uh, uh, urban trips, basically. And then 37% non-motorized transport, and then only 16% for public transport. So it's either people are walking or using their own cars before they actually use uh, private transportation. Uh, sorry, public transportation. I'll just skip to the next part over here because I think uh, we're like, taking up too much time. So let's go to the sustainability part. So I'll just quickly read the quick start here. Let me okay, here we go. So building on the, um, oh, I don't know what this like Burtnet report is. A sustainable urban mobility system is one that satisfies current mobility needs without compromising, blah, blah, blah. So similar to the definition of sustainability that we have. Uh, so satisfying current needs without compromising future generations. The idea of sustainability in urban mobility has moved beyond a focus on ecology and natural environment to also include social, economic, and institutional dimensions. So highlight that, like just breaking it down even further. Uh, it has moved beyond the preoccupation with movements and flows within urban settings to looking at enhancing proximity in space. So a holistic integrated approach to urban land use and transportation planning and investment is needed uh, if urban areas are to become socially and environmentally uh, and economically sustainable. So uh, let me just bring up your maps over here. So as I, as we mentioned sort of last week as well, uh, go back to grades. Let's go to your city profiles. Yes. I think I downloaded it. Yeah, I think I did download, refresh. So we have Calibo Municipality, we have Tacloban City, and then we have, uh, no, that's the wrong one. Tacloban City, ah, Butuan City. So I think we discussed this like a few meetings ago, but just like a refresher. With regards to transportation and urban mobility, the best sort of the most kind of impactful way of doing it is not by increasing our roads, although that's part of it. Um, it's really how we use our land. So if residential areas are continuously getting developed further away from the city center, then they have no choice but to use private transportation to get them to where they need to go in a sort of comfortable amount of time or like their preference, a competitive amount of time, if you will. So notice that, and this is Butuan City, there are very few sort of red areas, the commercial areas, just here in the city center. We have a C2 over here. I think MU, MU1B is like a special zone. Let me double check, it should be somewhere here. Oh no, there's no uh, translation. Um, Karen, what does the pink land use symbolize? Oh, uh, wait, sir. I, oh, okay, I no, okay. Uh, uh, just look look it up and then I come back to me later. Um, anyway, what I'm trying to highlight is in Butuan City, even though it has a lesser population, it's kind of um, sort of maybe not intentionally, but uh, 
the way it's being developed, you see that the commercial areas are still very much focused here without like sort of new commercial areas for like being developed over here. And this like new development to the east. So this might be uh, sort of a red flag when it comes to urban mobility. So unless there's like some new uh, commercial areas being developed here, people will be forced to travel longer distances, which would increase congestion, increase pollution, et cetera, et cetera. And basically what I'm trying to say, if we have more mixed use development, less of these like huge chunks of residential, there would be less need to travel in the first place. So it's not about improving the need or like the physical width of the road, but providing for the behavior or like the, what do you call this? Providing more opportunities for residents to work closer to where they live. So they don't have to travel in the first place. And then this is in Calibo. So kind of like the opposite is happening. You have a lot of like uh, zoning for commercial areas. And it seems like the road network is fairly permeable, meaning like um, there's a lot of crisscross intersections, like you can get from one point to the other, not necessarily following the main highway. There's some, um, uh, like we call this, intersections over here. And I really like the, for me, from my perspective and my experience, I think increasing the amount of commercial spaces is good. And it seems like um, general commercial zone, the residential spaces are more fairly distributed around like smaller roads here uh, to the south and like south uh, east. So this might be a better sort of like development pattern, depending if they can, of course, uh, implement it. And then finally, we have where is like, oh, Tacloban was a JPEG somewhere here. Finally, we have Tacloban over here. Um, I think the scale is also an issue. Uh, we have some blue areas, institutional areas mixed in with a bit of commercials on the periphery in the southeast area. And then in the city center, it's all commercial with like the residential areas being pushed further away because that's just like the, the traditional way of developing uh, cities or developing towns. So uh, the advocacy or the advice of like developed countries is to have these like residential areas move closer also to the city center, maybe some mixed use developments um, like with commercial ground floors and residential upper floors. But of course the uh, residential space here will be more expensive than those further away. But really just the goal is not increasing road width, but like um, providing spaces or like providing land use that will eliminate the need to travel in the first place or like eliminate the need to use private vehicles or public transportation and then just use non-motorized transportation instead. But that's a bit idealistic, I know, but that should be the thinking for like uh, development uh, in, in all cities like today. So eliminating the need for actually going long distances by making sure our zoning, our land use plans facilitate more mixed use development. So easier said than done, I know, but like um, this is like how uh, the thinking has changed from like, we'll just increase the roads to like, we'll provide more public transportation and like more incentive to not travel by having more mixed use developments. So something like that. So I'll just put that here. So shift from uh, increasing uh, road widths, let's say road, yeah, road widths and the uh, uh, private vehicles. Uh, to uh, mixed use development that uh, reduces the need for uh, long distance uh, trips, something like that. Okay, next, connecting that to the lack of parking. So there's this very, uh, not really contentious, but this idea that, I think I'll just connect this to the other one back here. Wonder if I can get back like that. Oh, there we go. Lack of parking. 
So uh, this is not really inherently a wrong idea, but we're like uh, starting to move further away from it because again, we want more public transportation. We want more people to use like uh, public transportation instead of their own car. And then the parking itself, if we provide like too much parking, uh, let's just put here uh, too much in quotation marks. So like it really depends on the city, the setting, how much available parking space is there in the first place, the existing parking space versus the proposed new parking space might um, encourage more private uh, transportation and discourage uh, public transportation. So the thinking behind this is like in uh, developed countries are seeing that if you provide a parking space, that will incentivize people to use their private vehicles. And if you take away parking space, meaning like in their areas of work, there's no place to park, it's limited, they will choose instead to kind of use public transportation, trains, buses, etc. And then to some extent, this has seen some success. Definitely, if we reduce parking space, less people will drive. So it's just at that level. The broader economic and like cultural impacts, I don't think there's literature on how effective it is, but that's just the current thinking, like based on my experience. And then finally, power shortages. Power shortages. This is really more of like uh, based on the discussion over here. Uh, power shortages, uh, which causes frequent brownouts, is uh, Faye back already? Yes, sir. Check. Hello. Hello. Okay. Um, just like I need a quick background on the power shortages. So, what's causing the power shortages in your like uh, experience? I'm not really sure, sir. But um, they always schedule it around um, every Sunday or sometimes Saturday. Mm. I think they have to fix something or or na ay kind of problem with the. Uh, source I'm not sure if it's in in Iloilo or other city or somewhere in Visayas mm -hmm. usually na, na reason uh, so, needing repair so we don't know the reason uh, that's, uh, that's fine but yeah it's very difficult to solve problems without uh, having uh, the causes so uh, we'll just skip that we'll just I'll just remove this <laughs> Okay, so basically in uh, sustainability, going back to what we discussed, um, cities can be more sustainable by just looking at uh, the physical factors, economic factors, and social factors. And this sort of thinking, basically breaking it down into systems will help us create more like feasible sort of solutions. And then whatever those solutions are, uh, after midterms, we'll go to like something even more specific will choose one topic in each of your cities and try to like really fre flesh out what kinds of like policies or plans could be used to uh, what they call this actually help your local community but of course we'll keep it like um co conceptual not like super detailed now you can actually implement it right away because like uh, we need a lot of input from like uh, government officials, uh, other professionals, but just the process is what we're going to focus on. And then talking about transportation, uh, the narrow sidewalks and the lack of parking um, are actually not sort of different problems, but they're very much interconnected in like uh, the idea of urban mobility. So uh, narrow sidewalks encourage more private vehicle use so if you increase like sidewalks there will be more pedestrians uh, people could walk to the places they need to go um, increasing road widths or like uh, increasing what do you call this the space for roads by uh, road right of way acquisition could be good but only if you prioritize public transportation and then the lack of parking um is really not so much a problem uh, if that area already has parking and you're just planning to add uh, because adding too much parking might encourage more people to shift to private transportation so that's basically how i would believe like 
uh, uh, you would approach making Kalibu more sustainable. So Kalibu and Aklan. So that's like uh, those are those issues, those are the issues for that specific area. Okay, let me edit this. Which one is uh, Karen? Which one is yours again? Is it the one? Uh, but one, oh, but one. Okay. Nine, one down here. Yeah. Okay. So let me remove this. So let's focus on Butuan and I'll add, let's see here. I'll add, delete. Oh no, I saved it. Okay, I'm closing. File, save as documents, MUP 204 discussion. Okay, it's already 4.19. Okay, it's like an hour. Uh, let me delete this. Let's focus on Butuan next. Delete slide. Bible Hall, delete slide. slide. Okay. okay. So the issue for Butuan City, uh, that's a refresher for Joseph who wasn't with us earlier because he's in a different class, is that Butuan City is growing. Uh, it has like good, decent access to water, power is not so much a problem. Uh, what Karen highlighted is the need to improve uh, Butuan's sort of image to keep the population, or keep the younger population in the city. So uh, need to look urbanized, the need to look urbanized, like increasing awareness of the uh, strengths of Butuan despite looking uh, very rural. Um, some of the things we discussed earlier were, what do you call this? Uh, developing new schools and like uh, developing new landmarks. New landmarks. So this isn't a very common problem in uh, what do you call this? Urban development. But let me see here. I think a good way to tackle this would be um, urban design. Uh, I would refer to this book uh, by Urban Design Street and Square. So this is more a visual analysis, uh, not really visual, but like a visual approach to creating sort of beauty or uh, in urban areas. So this is more urban design and like not really urban planning, but you can talk about, I'll just skip here, to do, 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 do. basic design concepts. Let's go down here. Oh, no, now we can skip that. That's like proportion, scale. You already know this if you're an architect. Uh, and I know Karen's already an architect, so we'll just skip that. Let's go to composition principles in a city. That's like do, 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 do. Okay, towns and buildings. So uh, let me just open up actually a different module over here that more fits the problem the situation for butuan it's in my uh, des urban design class let's go to towns and buildings so this is the summarized version of that book so what this book says are uh, written by moten in like 2003 originally printed in like the 1990s i think let me double check to do let me double check this book. And of course, I can give you this book if you want it. So first published in 1992, and then this version, the third edition has been published in 2003. So it's still, it's kind of like 20 years old, but there should be a new version somewhere. And I don't think it uh, changed its con its content so much. So we were going from like urban uh, mobility to something like uh, more uh, urban aesthetics. So. What Moten describes as five methods of composi composition to create beautiful cities is number one, buildings and landscape. Let me just write it down for you. Uh, new slide. Um, Moten, 2003. Uh, five methods of urban composition. Moten. It's a bit removed from urban planning because like uh, that's just the nature of like creating this look, creating this visual quality of an urban area. Let me reduce the font size so that it fits. Yeah, something like that. 
because in urban planning, we're basically limited to just the policy making, as we discussed before. Um, the videos should still be like on our YouTube. Uh, let me open up my YouTube here. Oops, oops, I closed it. So we have a sort of playlist for our class. So we have our meeting one lecture, meeting two lecture, and uh, I also included the GIS urban planning lecture in here, um, just for like, what they call this? Because uh, we still, we're still talking about urban planning and the other subject. And there's also a playlist here for urban design. So we want to learn more about that, like these five compositions, which I shall like quickly discuss uh, for the benefit of uh, Butuan City. Okay, going back, oh wait, I'll send you the, the link to this so you can like watch it later. Uh, do, 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 do. Yeah, I organizing my lectures. I can also look at lectures from urban planning and other QJS videos. Okay. Anyway, so there's five methods of composition. Let me just make sure buildings and landscape. Landscape. So this is a bit more abstract because we're talking about aesthetics. Uh, we'll close this. Close this, close this. Uh, yes. Reference books. Save. Okay, okay, okay. Closing, closing. Okay, we'll leave that open. Uh, buildings and landscape. Buildings of simple geometric shape. Geometric shape. The right angle. Uh, Axial compositions, compositions, and uh, spatial compositions. The informal and uh, formal settings. And this is, this has like three or was four? Like four, was one, two, three. Uh, Three requirements for a good composition. For a good composition. Composition, which is, let me see if I can back. back. Uh, sufficient space, architectural treatment, and a dominating building. Sufficient, let's number it here. Sufficient space. Architectural treatment and a uh, dominating building. Building, okay. Space. Right angle is focusing on uh, similar vanishing points, uh, harmonizing, harmonizing uh, vanishing points. And then um, a line in the axial composition is more like urban planning scale already. Um, I'm going to call this uh, aligning major public buildings, arranging, arranging public buildings uh, on an axis. And this is arranging a public space. That's public space period in general. <laughs> okay, let me change these to numbers. I think numbers will work here. And this is a this thing. Okay. So yeah, I would like I'll just do this very quickly. Just in this module. Okay. Uh, actually, we need a sample here. Let's go to Rome real quick. Okay. So the summary of these five comp methods of composition, buildings and landscape refer to how a specific building is uh, situated in like any site. For example, we have the Colosseum. Uh, when, when I say informal and formal settings here, informal refers to uh, sort of sculptural buildings, sculptural buildings and formal settings means like a, a, what they call this more classical, classical slash blocky buildings. 
basically traditional forms, Roman classical forms. So the Roman Colosseum would probably ident- like fit more in the classical setting, uh, mostly because it's a traditional shape. And then uh, what they call this, but the setting itself, the site, would fit more on the informal setting. So the idea is if a building would be what Moten calls an informal building when it is highly sculptural and can be viewed or is meant to be viewed from all sides, basically a landmark. So let me just put that here, Uh, equals landmark. So like we discussed earlier, having a landmark would really make your city look more beautiful instantly. If you have a really good building somewhere in a significant space in your city, that would make, uh, that would improve the building, uh, what they call the the built environment significantly in Butuan. And then these formal buildings are more like uh, traditional buildings, Uh, not really landmarks, but the opposite of landmarks, traditional buildings of work, basically. So, how you would sort of compare that is, so we have our uh, landmark over here and everywhere else should be a classical or like a traditional and uh, formal building. So notice the blocks and rows of blocks of streets over here. For some reason, my Google Maps is not letting me drop in. Drop in. I don't know what's going on. Sometimes it gets buggy. There you go. Okay. So this is what Moten or like uh, what I mean when I say uh, formal buildings, more blocky, more uniform, not exactly the same, but uh, mostly similar and symmetrical. So what's missing in Butuan City, if you notice, um, let me bring up Butuan City here, is there's really not much of like uniformity in the streets, the building heights, the building designs. So it creates this very kind of empty or like uh, dry, dry, uh, lack of another word for ugly. <laughs> Sorry, yes, I just sir. Like, there's really no other way to put it. So um, the policy, the urban planning policy should be that all buildings should maintain a specific height to create this sort of uniformity and like uh, block na, na, na setting, which also makes it a bit more uh, pleasant looking, but at the same time, it also creates a character Bitao, for the city. Like Rome, it's because it's Rome, it's one of the oldest cities in the world that already has a distinct character. And I think Butuan, if we look at Google here, Butuan City, oh, I'm low bad, hang on. Was established in, uh, I should say somewhere over here. Cityhood was in 1950. So it's barely been 50 plus 20. It's like barely less than 100 years old. While Rome is like has been around since BC times before, before Jesus Christ. So they already have an identity. So something like that. So in terms of urban planning, the goal would be for Butuan City, for like a more specific policymaking thing, is unif- unify the building heights unify like um, setbacks. So notice the Dunkin' Donuts, the setback here on the second floor is different from the setback on the lower floor. And then if you look over here, you have a gas station. Gas stations in general are like, in terms of aesthetics, one of the worst looking spaces in a city because it's it's just like a roofed area and that concrete looks very unattractive. Um, and over here, you see the Greenwich is one floor shorter than the Chowking next to it also set. It's also it's set back at a different sort of distance, and this sort of irregularity really makes it um, less aesthetically pleasing uh, than it could have been if everything was more uh, regulated. That the building facades would be of the same setback, and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. So that's what I mean when I say the formal sort of setting. And then, of course, as you mentioned earlier, you also need like a landmark for Butuan City, just like a place located in a place that's like meaningful for the Butuanons, like somewhere they visit always, somewhere that means something to them. Okay, so that's that was just the first method. <laughs> Sorry, it's taking a while. I go faster. 
the buildings of simple geometric shape, the example for this would be the um, Pisa complex. The Pisa complex in Italy. Do, 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 do. Oh, no, not Italy, Florence. There we go. Uh, where am I? Here we go. So if you have like a landmark, this is more for landmarks that um, if you have several buildings in that, in that landmark, for them to look good, they need to be, uh, let me make this maximize, they need to have sufficient space so you can look at the landmark on all sides, like you can walk around it, you can experience it with like a nice landscape, like a basically open space. They need to have a similar treatment, like same architectural style, and they need to have a dominating building. So we can see all of these like three requirements uh, very clearly seen in like the Pisa complex and other sort of similar uh, landmark buildings. So we have the baptistry, we have the cathedral, we have the leaning tower and the Campo Santo, basically the cemetery. And the way it's situated in the, the urban context, it's completely different from the more formal like housing and like maybe commercial mixed commercial areas here. Everything else is blocky, and then the Pisa complex is its own thing. It stands out. And why it looks good, even though it's like four separate buildings, is because you have sufficient space to walk around it. They have similar architectural styles, the, the Renaissance, Renaissance architectural styles. And then you have the dominating building. Uh, some of my students argue whether it's the baptistry, the church, or the leading tower, but each of them have like very specific like qualities that one of them could be the dominating, but like they all work together. For me, I would argue that the baptistry is the unifying element of this competition, but uh, composition. But some, um, I would still agree that if students say it's a cathedral because it's basically the biggest thing, or if it's the leaning tower, it's basically the tallest thing. So one defining dominating characteristic to like uh, help unify like these like almost like random group. Of, groups of buildings. Also notice how it looks like from the street level. Now you have nothing blocking it. Like if you have a landmark, make sure it's preserved. We have this, uh, we had this problem with the Manila, what was it called? Manila Rizal Park, uh, photo bombing, photo bomb. Uh, where is it? Uh, this thing. So the issue was we have this like very tall commercial building just hiding, just ruining the vista of the, I forget uh, the Manila park. I forget the name of this park. Torre de Manila, sir. Torre de Manila, okay. Uh, yes. So before it was all clean and now you have this like ugly, Not it's not, that, it's not really an ugly building. It's just in the way, ruining the landscape uh, and like the the quality of the space, like if like if you were here, it would be the equivalent of putting like a very tall like hotel behind the leaning tower of Pisa, and then it just ruins the whole experience for everyone. So yeah, that's basically the second uh, method of composition. The third method is a bit kind of hard to wrap your mind around, but like I'll try to explain it. It's harmonizing vanishing points. So we can see this a bit in this composition in the leaning uh, in the Pisa complex, but more so in London. So the example for Moten here is in London. It's the uh, wind, uh, the Churchill Churchill Gardens, London. So the Churchill Gardens in London is a series of like uh, residential buildings mixed with some institutional buildings. I think, I think these are dormitories as well for a school nearby. I think the school is somewhere here on the left. And then if you go into this like a complex of buildings, you notice that they're all very blocky. And uh, what Moten is trying to say right angles is that all the buildings are either parallel or perpendicular to each other. So uh, I wonder if it'll be clear here. And that's not really clear. You can see these different sort of housing units here, much better in 3D, either parallel and then their supporting structures are perpendicular and it creates this very, like uh, Moten would say, enclosed space that has its own character separate from, it's also like uh, in an area where everything is very blocky, but specifically this 
uh, residential complex really follows like having buildings be parallel or perpendicular. Uh, it's not following the neighbors where it's like at an angle, but everything is parallel. Uh, also similar to here, where it's like some parallel and some like at an angle, like not right angle, but uh, here everything is at 90 degrees. And what that achieves is uh, you create sort of, um, how do I say this, a frame. The buildings become a frame. So let me just take a sn snapshot of this to really explain. The buildings become the framework for vistas or like open uh, open space. So this building here becomes like a like the wall of a room. This building here also functions as a wall of the room, and then you are here standing in the park, basically enjoying the space, being sort of enclosed but not kanang. It doesn't give the the feeling of claustrophobicness or like claustrophobia, but you are uh, in a space that's like well defined. You have the views to the other buildings here and you stand here and you you know like uh, where you are. And like what I mean by vanishing points harmonizing is that this building because it's parallel has the same vanishing point as I call this building one and I call this building two. They have the same vanishing point because they're parallel. And if you look at a space where uh, for example, something like this. Let me take a snip of this, snipping this. Actually, we need a bit bigger. So this building to our left vanishes, has a vanishing point that goes down there. And then this building to our right also kind of goes down there. Because they are perpendicular, at some point, the... Uh, perspectives would intersect, uh, the vanishing points would intersect like somewhere here, and it just creates for a more like pleasing aesthetic um, effect. Also, it helps with wayfinding. So basically, if you're in a house and all the angles, you, but usually as architects, we try to keep everything perpendicular and um, parallel in our floor plans. There's no like awkward angles. This is really just to help with wayfinding so you don't get lost in your own house. And then just comparing that with Butuan City. Okay, it's already almost five o'clock. Uh, I really want to wrap up, get to Takloban. <laughs> let's go to Butuan City over here. Um, let's say, let's go to the city center. I think this is uh, fairly achieved because everything is like on a grid. It's really just that. The architectural styles of each building are too different that it's not uh, unified. So I think for this particular method of composition, uh, Butuan City has succeeded. Okay, moving on. Actual compositions, arranging major public buildings on an axis. So we'll go back quickly to Rome for this. I think we can also just check out England. Um, let's see here. Kingston Palace. I'm not sure exactly what this building is. It looks like a uh, royal like house or something should be connected to another like significant public structure. Uh, actually, we don't see much here. Let's go back to Rome. <laughs> uh, excuse me, Rome. We can see this a lot more clearly. Let's look at St. Peter's Basilica. So St. Peter's Basilica here on the left side of the screen connects to uh, Castel San Angelo or like a Saint Angelo uh, chapel or something. And then it should connect to like, uh, if we go like down this road, it would connect to like um, another significant, oh, the Pantheon over here. The Pantheon is like fronted by a plaza. The plaza is, isn't really connected to anywhere else. Um, I think we'll just limit ourselves here. So basically what I'm trying to say, sorry, I'm really pressed for time. I'm like moving very fast. Um, a major city building, like a major uh, landmark should be connected via access, like whether it be a road, a street, usually it's really, really a road or street or boulevard connected to another significant public space, like a landmark as well. So St. Peter's Basilica connected to Castel San Angelo is an example of that. In Cebu City, we have something similar. Cebu City, we have um, 
the capital building aligned with the uh, Fuente Osmeña circle. So the capital building is here, uh, middle of my screen, and the Fuente Osmeña circle is here, the bottom of the screen. So something like that. Now, the only issue with this is that there's a limit actually to how far you should uh, make the avenues go. Because when you go down here, hopefully it works. Uh, here, I can't even see the Capitol building anymore. Uh, they advise, Moten advises in his book, about 1,500 meters, which is not very long. So if you compare this, like Rome, measure distance to this, it's only 600 meters. If we go compare the um, Osmania circle and the Capitol building, measure distance there to there, it's also like 695 meters, uh, which is probably because they anticipated that. But the issue is all the other buildings surrounding this space are dwarfing um, Capitol building such that you can't see it anymore. Also, the landscaping on the road also prevents you from seeing the Capitol building. The trees are blocking the view. The Trees in the middle of the road are also blocking the view uh, compared to how they did it in Rome. Like they have the same distance, which is correct, but they protected the vistas, the viewpoints. So here you can see nothing is blocking St. Peter's Cathedral. If I go to the center of this sort of boulevard or road or avenue, uh, where did it go? Uh, over here, I should be able to see the Castel San Angelo back here. I'll move to the center of the street. It's because it's kind of like to the left, you can't really see it, but ideally um, for this method of composition to be at its maximum, you should be able to see both uh, landmarks at both ends. I think you can see the, uh, probably not, I'm already moving a bit further away yet. You can't really see the Fuente Osmeña circle anymore. So yeah, visibility at both ends and then probably I'll just like skip spatial planning for like a discussion on urban design because it gets really, really uh, complicated when you get to the fifth level. <laughs> but those are the four levels I really need to discuss um, Takloban and then the issues brought forth by um, Joseph. Okay. Mm, Takloban City down here. Okay. So. Uh, in terms of sustainability for Tacloban City, let's see what uh, Joseph highlighted here. Uh, ongoing issues, expanding city. Tacloban is an expanding city in terms of population, while its land area remains the same. In 2020, the total population of the city increased to 251 people. Apparently, this increase contributes to the existing issues or problems such as flooding, increase in housing backlog, and worsening of the traffic congestion. So I'll just highlight it here so we remember for next meeting, uh, insert uh, text box. Okay, uh, let's see here. So that was flooding, flooding, housing backlog, and traffic congestion. Okay, thankfully it's like more or less a similar topics that we already discussed. So let's put that in red and bullet points. Okay. So this is where zoning and analyzing our zoning maps are the actual physical structure of our cities is very important because then we can figure out if the land use planning is either contributing to the problems or helping to mitigate the problems. So flooding, I think there's really not much you can do because like Tacloban is kind of like a coastal city. There's the only way really is just to set back away from um, the edge of the water. Are there any rivers in uh, inside the Cloban City, Joseph? Uh, no, sir, only creeks. Mm -hmm. So, uh, sorry, the flooding is usually along the coast the coastline. Uh, no, sir, it's uh, within the subdivisions mostly. Uh, in the yellow areas here. Yes, sir. So what is causing the flooding? Uh, what do you think is causing the flooding? Well, aside from the um, tagdito, yung physical characteristics of Tacloban, um, mm -hmm. it has also something to do with the uh, man-made changes 
uh, specifically with the drainage plan of Tacloban. So there's really not a um, well-established drainage plan of Tacloban. So that is one of the uh, reasons why uh, there is a perennial flooding, uh, mostly in, in the subdivisions of Tacloban. Mm -hmm. So this uh, drainage system is not working. Okay, okay. So yeah, I think that's a very sort of a uh, good deduction because very likely um because there are a lot of people here a lot of people need to like drain <laughs> use the drainage system if the drainage system isn't working my, my back up on drainage system and then the flooding occurs during uh, rain and then the rain doesn't have anywhere to go and which further increases the housing another pro the flooding problem okay with this housing backlog um i think it's also contributed to the uh, increasing population uh, in your experience, uh, is there any other causes for the housing backlog in Tacloban? Um, I think it has something to do with the affordability of um, what is being offered right now. Uh, yung mm. mga, kasi, although the price ceiling of the um, dito, housing projects, yung mga sub subdivisions, mm. is somehow affordable, but kung titingnan natin sa uh, purchasing power ng Tacloban I I don't think uh, kaya nila yung uh, yung mm. price ceiling mm. okay good and of course traffic congestion you can already see from the zoning map the city center very much a distance away from the subdivisions and I think um, are there any mixed use developments in the city center like uh, that you've observed like being made uh, Joseph uh, no, sir, there is no mixed use. As yeah, well. yeah. So really, um, as we discussed earlier, one of the major causes of traffic congestion is really how we zone our cities or how we create, uh, how we plan our cities, because these are based on models from the 1970s, where the car is like, uh, as we discussed earlier, the most popular preferred mode of transportation. And nobody really thought that what would happen if you increase the number of people using cars, you very quickly run out of road space and that causes uh, traffic congestions. There's some sort of new thinking that traffic congestion might be a good thing because then that will force people to use um, more like other modes of transportation like cycling, walking, and buses. And then some people would even go uh, further and say that the increase in gas prices might be a good thing because that will also in like uh, influence people to use other modes of transportation and but oh, excuse me yeah. but it's still kind of a big problem because though what happens to those families and those people that are sort of reliant on uh private vehicles to get to their jobs i think they have no other options like if you don't uh buy gas they can't get to work and if they can't get to work they can't get paid etc etc it's just a, a vicious cycle now very much disproportionately impacts the on um the lower income people or the the people who don't have the choice for other modes of transportation in our cities uh today so okay um let's see here it's already f almost like i have 10 minutes let me see here. I think that's everyone. Uh, yeah, that is everyone for sustainability. Let me just go back here to our modules. Uh, modules, let me close this, this, this. I think um, if, Karen, you want a quick rundown of all the different uh, methods of composition that could be applied to Butuan, I'll just like uh, focus. I'll send you to this video where we discuss about that towns and buildings power one i think part two of oh, these are very long videos agilang because like maybe you might uh find it useful for both one specific uh situation let me put it here okay so currently we're on part three let me double check yeah part three is the latest one i think we have a part four coming but yeah we go into those five methods of compositions with more detail and like hopefully that will help you out uh in your sort of a uh situation in Butuan. okay now let's look at your essays um let's start with joseph because I, I feel like joseph is the most kind of uh left out because uh Faye and karen are with me in another class okay 
So Joseph made some very good points in his essay about the 17 SDGs and how applicable they are in the Philippines. So let's see here. Um, talking about zero poverty, a uh, very ambitious goal. And then talking about poverty incidents as the Philippine Statistic Authority defines it, it means um, the proportion of poor individuals whose per capita income is not sufficient to meet their basic food and non-food needs. So in 2018, the proportion of poor Filipinos was estimated at 21.1%, and which has greatly increased in the first semester of 2021 at 23.7% to around 61.14 million Filipinos. So that's about a 2% increase. And remember, the Philippines has like over 100 million people, and just 2% of 100 million is a lot of people. <laughs> okay. So this is a very like ambitious goal and like um yes it is very difficult i even i don't think it's gonna it's a problem that will be solved in the next like 100 years it's gonna take way longer than that uh zero zero hunger uh, as joseph points out here data shows that stunting and wasting is still prevalent in all regions so we have like problem with food which is very weird because we are supposed to be an agricultural uh, based country that we have like our ways to produce food, but still Filipino families are still kind of malnourished and struggling to like get food. And then finally over here uh, for the architects, um, human settlements, inclusive, human settlements should be inclusive, safe and resilient, also sustainable. Uh, and then like uh, this is SDG 11, sustainable cities and communities. And then if this is successful, uh, this would determine that you the achievement of all other goals. As of this, as of this writing, the human population today is about 7.8 billion, and like 55% of it, or around 4.2 billion people, live in urban areas. Uh, such a trend is expected to continue by 2050. Around 6.5 billion people will live in cities. And then over here, I'll just skip to uh, the quick summary here. By the end of the 20th century, over 600 million people of the world will be living in informal settlements and slums, which is really a big, big sort of challenge uh, for the built environment or the construction industry. And then specifically for the Philippines, the backlog is about 6.57 million units for the period of 2017 to 2022. So there's really no way that we can get 6 million units by the end of this year. So maybe we can slowly hack away at that number. Uh, reviewing the housing backlogs for each of our local communities and uh, maybe like creating some, uh, not really the final policy, but the direction or the guide to create the final policy. Um, and also like concrete like actions. Definitely, um, I'm not telling you guys to go out and fix housing in this class, but like we'll discuss it and maybe find some ways to make it uh, more doable or more feasible in our local communities. And then, yes, this is the question I want to ask to Joseph. Like, uh, can you see Tibayuka? Tibayuka? Um, uh, I forgot. I forgot to include sir, the, uh, no, the, 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 okay, right. this is, I would count this as a, like, first draft and we'll, like, uh, revise it probably. Um, this will be, uh, like, our midterm uh, plate, nah, like, making, uh, Four pages is a bit long, but maybe you can bit make this a bit more kind of concise because I'm planning to add another topic uh, which really goes hand in hand with sustainability uh, resilience. So, yes, so these are the good points here. I didn't grade it yet because like, I'm waiting for uh, Karen's work. <laughs> and then in phase submission here of like, uh, are, is sustainability applicable in the Philippines? She highlights like... Uh, three components of sustainability, basically echoing my uh, components of like urban planning and then talking about the SDGs. So um, over here, progress uh, currently uh, based on her observations, the progress in the Philippines is still slower than most countries, um, uh, who also committed uh, because of the, as of 2020, the Philippines ranked 99th out of the 166 countries in terms of SDG progress. So this is from the um, 
Uh, Faye, are you here? Uh, PSA, yeah, yes, yeah, sir. So PSA, initially, you can. Yes. Okay. So still work in progress. Not so much kind of, but like it's moving. It's moving, although a bit slower than other countries. So in general, I think we all agree that sustainability can be applied in the Philippines. And another topic we will be discussing um, uh, next week is resilience. So for the next 30 minutes, I'll try to introduce the idea of resilience. So I didn't have time to prepare my slides for this. So I'll just have to rely, rely on Google resilience. So there's actually, this was a big topic in my master's uh, study in uh, Sydney. So there are resilient cities. There was a movement called resilient cities. Uh, here we go. But first, what is resilience? Uh, let's see here. So simply, like I don't even want to use this because it looks too like uh, wordy. Resilience is just the ability to of a city or a, or a place to come back or like fix itself or repair itself after like a major disaster or like a major calamity. And then in I think 2018 or 2016, there was a movement called the Resilient Cities. And they should have a list here, urban resilience uh, communities of like the different sort of, uh, what they call this, uh, countries and cities who joined this movement. So I think there should be a list here somewhere. Okay, uh, let's see, resilient city movement. Let's see, this network got in life or Oh, apparently it actually died now. Ah, here we go. 100 resilient cities. I think this was it. Our communities are collaborating. Visit the website. And apparently it kind of lost track. Uh, let's see here. Uh, but we'll, we'll define resilience first. Uh, let's see. Worlds and cities and towns are more densely populated and more interconnected than, any, than ever before. Extreme weather, refugee crises, disease, pandemics. Uh, supply chain, cyber attacks. Uh, today's new normal requires models of governance that mitigate risk and respond to uh, evolving challenges. So this was published. Let me check the publication date of this article. It doesn't say uh, 2022. So these types of articles I'm typically not a fan of because I don't know who's writing it. It seems a bit like uh, abs like. The words, the wording, and the message is good, but I just want to put a face and a date so that uh, I know how old the idea is. Okay, anyway, let me open up PowerPoint here. You slide. Resilience. So on top of making our cities, like uh, making sure we manage our resources, uh, sustainability, sustainability equals managing resources, uh, resilience is really what they call this. In a way, managing our kind of, I guess I would say, um, I want to say people, but I want to like read a bit more about this. Let's see here. Uh, let's see. Oh, it actually, the, the website is gone. <laughs> So maybe resil the resilient cities movement was not very resilient. Let's see here. Urban resilience. Let's see. The capacity of individuals, communities, and institutions and systems within a city to survive, adapt, and grow no matter what kinds of stresses and shocks they experience. So basically, uh, ability to survive and grow. Ability to survive and grow uh, despite... Uh, Challenges, let's say challenges. So this includes natural disasters, uh, pandemics, earthquakes, etc. Cetera, et cetera. So this is sort of like another like step. Um, and as we see, it seems to have sort of faded out and kind of like the trend for urban planning movements, urban movements in general, that it has a good start, sticks around for maybe a decade, and then people forget about it. So I think it'd be interesting to see what happened. Uh, ability to not only recover from shocks, but also build build back better. So let's see here. 
So it's safe to say that the Rockefeller, this is the foundation that funded the movement, uh, organization known as 100 Resilient Cities, which was dif- disbanded effective August 2019, turned out to be, <laughs> uh, what do you call this, quite reformed in the wake of the Superstorm Sandy in 2012. This was the big typhoon in like which hit New York. The 80 per 80 plus person multi-million dollar initiative spent five years building a coalition, a coalition of cities to develop, plan, and implement strategies to address climate change and foster resilience in the US and around the world. The organization's early demise was an unexpected shock and yet was not nearly as shocking as what came next. Within six months, the world became engulfed in the uh in a what they call it, 100 year pandemic. So we could have gotten jobs uh, doing other things, but we felt compelled to continue this work. And it turns out it was very important. Blah, 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 blah. 100 students in a neighborhood scale. Blah, blah, blah. Okay. So basically, it came back as another thing. It became the Global Resilient Cities Network. So that's I guess that's what this is, the Global Resilient Cities Network. And then let me see here. They have like speakers, movements. So the idea is still pretty much the same. They just have like a rebranding. So let me go back here. So, uh, okay, uh, I know I, I said I wouldn't use this, but since this is the only thing that comes up, we'll just use it. So uh, urban resilience is a capacity, again, to like survive and adapt to shocks by strengthening its underlying fabric and deepening its understanding of the risk that threaten its stability a city can improve its overall trajectory and well-being and the well-being of its citizens uh, prosper in the face of challenges in both unexpected and uh, ways yet imagined urban resilience responds to three converging global mega trends uh, climate change urbanization and globalization so very quickly, uh, we already know about climate change, the rising temperatures, urbanization is the uh, phenomena that more and more people are moving towards cities and more areas in like different er- different places around the world are becoming more and more urbanized, more built up. And globalization, I think, uh, refers to how more and more the world is bec- becoming more interconnected, easier to contact people from other countries and like sort of this sort of coming together of different countries uh, around the world. So urban resilience demands that cities look holistically at their capacities and their risk, including uh, through meaningful engagement with the most vulnerable members of a community, etc. And then planning for a resilient urban f- future requires tackling challenges and creating solutions in a place-based, integrated, inclusive, risk-aware, and forward-looking manner. So it's just more steps to add to what uh, it's basically sustainability with uh, more steps and focusing on the risks and uh, the challenges in like specific cities. So let's look at this in the Philippine sense. So Philippines, we are, I would say, I think we would all agree, still rich in natural resources. Natural resources. Resources. So I think for us, we have increasing uh, population, uh, which indicates some form of economic growth. But we are very much vulnerable to our like annual typhoons. Uh, let's say an- vulnerable to annual natural uh, to natural disasters. And I think just going through our different examples here, Tacloban suffering from flooding, uh, Butuan City, uh, Karen, are you still there? Yes, sir. Ah, yes, uh, just a quick question. Uh, yeah, you have it here, flooding in most areas of the city due to the city's low elevation. Um, is yeah. it getting treated or is it like, is it getting better? It's like nobody doing anything about it. Uh, it's actually better than before, sir, but it's mm-hmm. still there because of yeah the low elevation. So what the mm-hmm. city did is they're trying to, yeah, like what we've discussed before the past mm-hmm. uh, ano, uh, discussions, na the city is trying to uh, relocate the mm-hmm. ano, 
the commercial areas. Okay, because... so it's really, uh, yeah, thank you. <laughs> Sorry, my and follow up question. Um, where is the flooding happening uh, specifically? Is it like just in the city center or is it also happening here like further deeper? To Along the, the river, sir. Along, Along the, the river, river. So Penny? Yeah. Oh, wait. Yeah. Penny, yeah, that, yeah, that one, sir. This line here. Uh, I think I can draw. The or... yellow one. The yellow one. Okay, so yeah. this is the one. Okay, so down here, like north south Namurag uh, River. Yeah, okay. Yes, sir. And then over here, uh, Kalibo, uh, also flooding, need for a drainage system plan. So, what we're doing here is basically defining further how do we like achieve sustainability and resilience is part of that. Making sure our cities are what they call this growing and managing its resources and at the same time having like infrastructure in place to protect ourselves from flooding and typhoon so i think this one resilience would be more doable than sustainability because it's more like uh, urgent uh, all of our cities are experiencing flooding and it's not so kind of lofty now we have zero hunger and zero waste because that's a whole like you have to like revamp the whole system, uh, engage a lot of people to get to solve like poverty and hunger and to solve waste, but making sure our existing systems are protected against natural disaster seems a bit more kind of doable, I think. And then this will be sort of the next part of your essay. Uh, I'll prepare a better sort of presentation uh, next week because uh, really, um, I really ran out of time this week. But think about how your city is already preparing for natural disasters and how does that connect to um, sustainability in your area? I'll provide more like guide questions in a bit. Um, let's actually like go down here. Uh, okay, I think I use the same slide over here. Let me just reduce the font size. Okay, uh, like that. Let me delete this. So we already talked about sustainability. Most of us said yes. Uh, so yes, uh, sustainability. Sustainability is applicable in the Philippines. But uh, Joseph has a follow-up question of like, it may not be doable <laughs> or it may not be implemented properly implemented properly because it's just such a high uh, this is for specific for the uh sustainable development goals uh for the sdgs sdgs but I'm, this is a question to the class. We'll have like another like uh, just 20 more minutes of discussion. Um, do you think that resilience is more applicable than say sustainability? Uh, anyone can volunteer or like jump in. Hola, hola. Oh, wait, no, sorry. Um, okay, just like to lead this discussion a bit further. Um, so I've been talking to Joseph like outside of class as well. And um, I, he proposed this idea of making uh, buildings that are more sort of resilient against typhoons or stronger against typhoons as something to do with the angle of the roof. Could you like talk more about this, uh, Joseph? Wait, am I still connected? Hello? Hello, Joseph? Uh, Wait. Yes, sir. Ah, yes. So just a quick question like on resilience. Uh, remember like I asked you to write an article, which probably like could be our midterm as well. Um, uh, how does this work? Like the angle of the roof? Uh, a 65 degree angle roof is proven to survive super typhoons. Uh, could you tell us more about this? Because we're on the topic of resilience. Um, actually, sir, I am still on on the process of knowing the the 
parang uh, verifying if it's actually true that 65 ah, okay, okay, okay. really resilient. I thought you had it. <laughs> So maybe this would be an interesting like uh, topic to discuss next week. I'll also help you find out because uh, I really want to research more on resilience uh, before we get into the next module over here. Because um, you got your submissions uh, sustainability really like made me think now. Yeah, maybe we should talk about resilience before moving on. Uh, anyway, let's see here. Um, uh, Karen or Faye, do you think? Uh, resilience is easier than sustainability or is it like another like sort of applicable but not really kanang applicable but difficult to implement in the philippines <laughs> something like that uh yeah okay mm -hmm. oh, for so me sir, our resilience is more achievable than sustainability mm -hmm. because tama to giing ni Joseph no, na medyo uh, ambitious ang atong mga atong SDG 17 unlike yes. resilience it's more of kanang implementation bitaw and uh solving the kanang current problem like for example mm -hmm. uh na may solution na we can uh kanang not build on hazardous areas. So, mm. for na lang yung mga kanang lack of implementation with our LGUs na kanang na yung gihapo yung motoko dito. Then, for the design pod, like, so, for example, no, kay, uh, we're part of the kanang uh, among national government agency is kanang ito, we are uh, kanang involved sa katang SDG 11 na creating a uh, resilient housing so lately uh, na naay mga gi gi uh, propose nag propose ang, ang emergency architects of UAP and mm. um, and it shape pod na unsa ang kanang resilient nga mga housing so ang um, NHA nag propose og kanang parapet type na roof roofing mga anak sir so it's more of kanang study lang na how to kanang unsa usually so balik-balik lang mangud ang atong hazards dere more on like typhoon flooding so Same more on thing. implementation lang jud siya sa atong ano unlike sustainability na murag especially katong no hunger no poverty oh, na kaya ba? it's very, no, murag very broad na kaayo na kaayo na problem like resilience yes unlike resilience yes. Yes, achievable lang if only uh kanang uh the kanang ang mga nakabalo would help out mm -hmm. okay okay so it kind of ends up like that for me that's why i really want to talk about this because it's in line with sustainability but also a lot easier and for me it's just more practical like if you see your house is getting damaged every day or like not every day every year from um typhoons and you it can very easily do something about it like make your roof stronger and then if it works for one house it can work for multiple houses flooding just don't build there make sure people set back have like uh your uh local police officers make sure that no squatters are there and so that the squatters are not enticed to build in the coastal areas provide housing make sure the housing is also an typhoon proof so it doesn't get blown away during the next typhoon much more concrete and can um, measurable goals compared to no hunger how do you measure that like everyone's gonna get hungry sometime <laughs> so um i'll make a new module for resilience and then our goal for this class will be to have um finish this canning uh like essay on sustainability and connect it to resilience um, hopefully by uh, April 2. We should submit that by April 2. We'll do a discussion again on the 26th, this time from like maybe 2.30 to 4.30, like two-hour discussion, really breaking down resilience, possible solutions for each of your Kanang um, cities. And then, yeah. So at the end of this SEM, we should have some kind of like uh, policy that, could be useful for our local situations. Um, I'll also try to provide my own sort of solutions for 
uh, Cebu City. Like, so you you guys will be guided. But uh, I have like uh, one proposal here, which I will, I will probably share there to you guys. Oh wait, we still have some time actually. Let me see. Uh, pedestrianization files. Okay. Folders empty. <laughs> uh, let me see. So recently, I was approached by one of my former students and also part of the Paul Sai Department of the University of San Carlos. Uh, let's see here, Projects 2021, pedestrianization. Um, I think this is the document. OK, this is the document. So this is more urban design than urban planning, which is that's just the way it goes. I wish I could like do an urban planning project, but it's really so big. And like they see me, I'm a young guy, not much experience. So uh, probably will take another like couple of years for, before I can actually handle an urban planning project. But this project here in Cebu City um, was initiated early, what they call this? December, 2021. I uh, know, no, that's a project date. It was proposed like maybe June, 2021. I was approached by one of my students to sort of improve a kind of section of street in front of Basilica del Santo Nino, one of the older churches in Cebu City, and just providing like a, a way to improve walkability in that area. And of course, because this is a um, working with Cebu City government, the, the budget was also very low. Um, the idea was that we want more people to visit the church, more people to visit the surrounding commercial areas. And my like initial sort of design was just to provide more shaded areas for walking because the street along the church over here does not have a sidewalk. So the goal was to provide walking spaces, improve the visibility of the church and increase the number of visitations or like visits or trips to the surrounding commercial areas. And what we ended up with just something super basic because we didn't want to go over budget. I think we had like uh, uh, 500,000, not 35, really like less. Um, I think 500,000 was the proposed budget, but like where do we get 500,000? And I, I don't know what else to build here aside from like uh, putting in tents. The ending was um, the tents idea was not exciting enough, which agreed, because like I was also working on school stuff at the same time with this. The ending is that we need to provide something interesting, like um, something that's eye-catching that can provide shelter and at the same time, maybe sitting areas. Sitting areas are also very important for public space. And then it, it can't be something uh, normal looking. So that's basically my struggle here. Um, this is too normal and how do you make it like more interesting, more creative? Uh, some people were throwing around ideas of like, uh, uh, where did it go? Uh, what, urbanism or tactical urbanism, tactical urbanism. It's another sort of branch of urbanism. Basically transforming public space to um, usually like unused streets. Uh, making it making them more pedestrian friendly, more visually interesting. So stuff like this. So how do you do that uh, for this area? Also, another thing that I forgot to mention um, for this particular project, uh, it would also be kind of temporary, um, not nothing like fixed because uh, cars will still need to go through here. Or maybe we could do something fixed like along the middle of the road. So that, because um, this area is not fully pedestrianized yet, it's only closed to vehicles during Fridays and Sundays, uh, afternoon, like 5 p.m. to like, uh, uh, or was it like the whole day? Was it like whole day? I can't remember. But Fridays and Saturdays, the road is closed and really can't do any permanent sort of um, fixtures. Paint. Paint could be a good thing, but we need to design the roads at, design the paint, design the space basically. So something like this. And uh, yeah, this could be an application of sustainability because as we all know, uh, making cities more walkable means like more people can move around the city. It doesn't cost fuel. It just, you just allow the space for people to walk in terms of resilience. Um, what do you call this? This area is not particularly prone to uh, natural disasters and then 
But definitely, if these tents were built here or like were set up here, it would have been destroyed by Odette. So the fact that the tents are very lightweight, um, hard to sort of maybe uh, put away uh, in, in like during a natural disaster, like a strong typhoon, maybe this proposal also is not very resilient. So something more uh, creative needs to be done. And that is where the project ended. Like we got stuck here, we got hit with a debt, and then I needed to like do fix my classes, which is my basically main source of income, like the, the academe. So I haven't been able to develop this idea further. <laughs> so that's just an example of like a real life project that kind of got uh, uprooted because of Odette and also like my own sort of limitations as a designer. Um, so hopefully that will like give you some ideas as to like your own project as well. That it's never easy and you just got to keep on doing it and like, uh, yeah, do your best. <laughs> so I think that's our time, 5.30 now. Thank you for attending this lecture. I'll stop recording. I'll upload the re recording.